Hello, this is Chapter 6, Organizations and Groups in Sociology 103. So before we actually dive into our topic, uh, I wanted to mention a famous case from 1997 where 39 members of the Heaven's Gate organization were told that they could reach the next level of existence via an extraterrestrial spaceship that was traveling along the tail of a comet. Um, Heaven's Gate was a religious cult in uh, the United States, and this handsome fella was the leader who told to followers that if they ingested a large amount of drugs and alcohol, they would get there. So all 39, including the leader, took the lethal cocktail and died. They were found wearing identical clothes and shoes. And this is actually a picture from the crime scene that um, they showed on the news multiple times, showing that these folks lived kind of in a dorm-like experience and they were all dressed completely identically. So um, they were all wearing black, including black Nikes, which let me tell you, Nike was not very happy about. And they all had this uh, dark purple shroud placed on them. So why would they do this? Why wouldn't one person say, nope, not going to happen. I'm not doing this. It's because essentially peer pressure or group pressure. Um, nobody wants to be the person who says no. So let's talk about group pressure in general. And uh, contrary to what some might think, uh, group pressure or peer pressure continues on well into your old age, not just during your teen years. Um, other examples of group pressure can include gang rapes which tend to be more violent and more severe than rapes involving only one perpetrator. The reason for this is because the group members succumb to the pressure of a dominant leader, as well as fearing being ostracized if they don't act accordingly. So basically, what we all want is to fit in. We want to be part of the group. And even in groups where people don't even know one another, like a jury, you see people unwilling to disagree with the consensus of the dominant group. Social influence and groups, and this is basically the idea that individuals are heavily influenced by the social influence of a group, whether it be a small group or a large group. Additionally, we are members of multiple groups. So we're part of a family group, we're part of a friend network, we're part of a work group, we're part of a school group, if you have particular hobbies, if you have an online presence with video gaming, for example, that could be a group. So a group, to define it, is two or more individuals who interact, share goals and norms, and have a subjective awareness as a social unit. In a nutshell, a dyad is a group of two, and a triad is a group of three. Now, just to look over here, we have a dyad. This would not be a triad because this doesn't imply equal relationship with both A and B. Rather, this would be considered a triad. The A, B, and C are all holding equal parts of a relationship. Now, you would think with only one more person, a triad behavior would not be that different from a dyad behavior, but it's actually significantly different than a dyad behavior. Researcher George Simmel, who was working in the early 1900s, looked at both dyads and triads and discovered that triadic separation tends to occur. This is when two of the three people form a dyad and the third person is isolated. Oftentimes, the isolated person will then try and create a coalition with one of the members of the dyad. So, once a person realizes that the three musketeers are really the two musketeers and the third wheel, the third wheel tries to ingratiate themselves with one of the member of the two musketeers in order to kind of um, 
subversively break up the dyad. Simmel's conclusion is that triads are inherently unstable, whereas dyads are stable. Simmel's research led to further studies on group size effect, meaning the effects of a group number on group behavior, regardless of the personality characteristics of the members themselves. So we'll be talking more about this topic in a few minutes, but essentially what he wanted to know is how many people in a group will result in certain activity. So, you know, a group of two and a group of three is what he studied. Down the road, they're going to study groups of four, five, six, and much larger than that. So we'll address that in a few more minutes. Primary groups were introduced by Charles Horton Cooley of the Chicago School, who also worked in the early 1900s. A primary group is a group that consists of intimate face-to-face -face interaction and long-lasting relationships. And these are things like your family, friendships from your childhood or teen years or college years. And these are all very positive. But there's also times when people have to form um, a primary group because of their location or their situation. And this can include inmates serving long sentences in prison, boot camp military newbies, or soldiers in a war zone, and street gangs. So oftentimes, especially for example in a war when you're getting shot at all the time, the person that you are standing next to, you become a very important person to that person and vice versa creating a primary group because your life is at stake all day, every day. Primary groups provide us what we, what is called expressive needs. Expressive needs include intimacy with others. And when we say intimacy, we're not talking about sexuality. We're talking about the ability to share one's hopes and dreams and aspirations with another person. You know, that conversation you have at two o'clock in the morning with someone that you are very good friends with. Also, expressive needs can include companionship and emotional support. Now this is compared to secondary groups, which tend to be larger in membership, less intimate, lo less long-lasting, less significant to your emotional lives, and this can include the groups including people who attend PIT, people who work for the same company that you do, um, people who work or live in the same town as you do. These are not people that you're intimate with. These are not people that you even know. These are people that you just happen to share a very big comparison with, meaning these are all the people who go to my college. These are all the people who live in my town, etc. Secondary groups tend to provide instrumental needs or what's called task-oriented needs. So an athletic team provides fun and entertainment. People can say, oh, did you watch the Eagles game or did you watch the Phillies game? And that creates kind of a sense of community. Political groups identify beliefs and the ways to influence the country. You know, if somebody identifies as a Democrat or a Republican or a Libertarian, then that gives you kind of a shorthand of what their beliefs are. And then corporations provide income and status. So the secondary group of everyone we work with at our, at our company um, becomes a way of achieving a certain level of prestige among our peers. In addition, we also have something called reference groups. Reference groups are groups that you may or may not belong to, but are used as standards for evaluating attitudes, values, and behaviors. Essentially, these groups are role models for individuals to emulate. So, for example, you might think that a particular group of athletes that were on a team together, for example, the early 90s when the 
Michael Jordan led the Chicago Bulls or the Philadelphia Phillies in the late 70s and early 80s when Mike Schmidt was um, playing, you might say, boy, those are the kinds of guys I want to be like. Or you have people like Meryl Streep and the people who she acts with who are just excellent actors, and that might be the person you identify as the standard or the reference for great acting. Then we need to define in-groups versus out-groups. An in-group is a social group to which a person psychologically identifies as being a member. So for myself, I would identify as being female. I would identify as being an American. I would identify as being a teacher and so on and so forth. By contrast, an out-group is a social group to which an individual does not identify. So I would not call myself Chinese, I would not call myself a man, and I would not call myself a um, tall person. <laughs> the next concept is attribution theory. This is how we make conclusions about others' personalities. Research has shown that a person's perceptions are distorted when based on whether that person is an in-group member or an out-group member. Meaning, we assess a person's behavior and we determine if it's good behavior or bad behavior based on our own set of biases. So, for example, if I see someone who is um, having a drink, like a cocktail, I don't think that it's a bad thing because from my culture, having a drink is fairly normal. Whereas if I was from Saudi Arabia and I saw someone having a cocktail, I might think that that person was committing a major sin because the um, Islamic principle is that you should not have cocktails. So we look at the world through a filter of our own biases. Now, what happens is that our attitudes about specific behavior is also impacted by the in-group and out-group phenomena. So, for example, in a business setting, a man who is aggressive and ambitious is seen in a positive light by the other men in his company, whereas a woman displaying similar behavior might be seen as pushy or a bitch. So somebody like Steve Jobs, who was acknowledged as not a very nice person, was seen as this terrific businessman, whereas somebody like Hillary Clinton, because she is also aggressive and ambitious, was called all kinds of names, because that's not how a woman should act. A woman should be nice, she should be considerate, and not aggressive or ambitious. Now, happily, Attitudes have changed with the various generations, but there are still, you know, the older generations that absolutely would never vote for her because she is what we again call a bitch. They don't want a bitchy woman in the White House. This often leads to errors made in attributions for people's behavior because we see them as part of the in-group or the group we belong to and or the out-group or the groups that we don't belong to. And of course, it's human nature to see in-groups positively and out-groups negatively. So for example, you know, somebody who is not tattooed might perceive, and remember it's perception, might perceive somebody with tattoos as being sleazy. and you know, the fact of the matter is that that's like saying that everybody with red hair is sleazy. It's a gross generalization. And that's what attribution errors often are. For example, a man assuming that all women are bad drivers. Well, Dana Kilpatrick might disagree. Again, gross generalization about a group that we don't belong to. And then my last example, a Hispanic person assuming all white people are prejudiced. Are some white people prejudiced? Absolutely. Are all white people prejudiced? No. So that's something I really want you to focus on 
in your own day-to-day -day life is to avoid these gross generalizations because they're just not true. You can't say that all men are dogs because not all men are dogs. You can't say that all women are emotional because not all women are emotional. Are some? Yes. And then that's where you change your descriptor. Instead of saying all guys, you say some. Instead of saying all women, you say some. It's just one word and you will sound a lot smarter in your life. A social network is a link between individuals, between groups, or between other social units. So your interaction with people via social media, i.e. Facebook and Twitter, are included in this concept. So what you have to think about is, you know, maybe you have a cousin that lives in Delaware and you make friends with somebody at school who has a um, family that also lives in Delaware and you find out that people in both of your circles actually know each other and that's the kind of social links I'm talking about we have our primary social links and then as we move out less primary or secondary social groups especially our primary groups influence far more often than we realize so our social groups and again for the most part we're talking about primary social group has a very significant impact on us we generally might rebel against our family for political or religious context but by the time we hit our 30s we've pretty much returned to the so-called fold because we grew up with those kind of people we made friends with those kind of people and as we get older we realize that maybe our mom and dad weren't so wrong or maybe our mom and dad had some insight into religion that really worked out so we tend to return to where we came from this next set of slides discusses the ash conformity experiment so in an in terms of if someone came to you and said hey are you a conformist most of us would say no none of us want to believe that we're a conformist a s researcher named Solomon Ash decided to test this so in his experiment and just take a look over here at these two picture boards this one has three different lengths of lines and they're labeled a B and C the point was a person was asked to identify which uh, line over here most closely matched this line and they were told they were basically engaging in a vision test now unbeknownst to the subject of the test meaning the person who was being tested the other people in the room actually worked for the researcher so for example this guy is the subject the other six guys work for the researcher and the subject didn't know that so at first the confederates or the assistants all answered the questions correctly but eventually began providing incorrect answers at some point the subject began changing their answer to the answer the group gave which might be shockingly wrong nearly 75 percent of the participants in the conformity experiments went along with the rest of the group at least one time after looking at all of the experiments all of the times they did it with different subjects the results indicated that participants conform to the incorrect group answer about one-third of the time so some people are more likely to be conformist than others others might only conform once others might conform three four five times in order to ensure the participants were able to accurately gauge the length of the lines participants were asked to individually write down the correct match and the subject figured out the correct match 98 percent of the time but overall about one-third of the time 
they change their answer to reflect that of the group. Why would they do this? They do this because they need to conform to the group and the size of the group matters significantly. The experimenters looked at the effect that the number of people present in the group had on the subject. When there was only just one other confederate or assistant present, there was virtually no impact on the participants' answers. The presence of two confederates only had a tiny effect. When there were three or more assistants in the room plus the subject, that's when you saw the level of conformity shoot way high, way up. The bigger the group, the more people are likely to conform to the dominant answers. So at the conclusion of the experiments, participants were asked why they had gone along with the rest of the group. In most cases, the students stated that while they knew the rest of the group was wrong, they didn't want to risk facing ridicule. A few of the participants suggested that they actually believed the other members of the group were correct in their answers. And what these results suggest is that conformity can both be influenced by a need to fit in and obey a belief that other people are smarter or better informed. As an instructor, I see this Every semester I teach, you know, the first day of class, especially in the fall when all I have a lot of new freshmen, I see a sea of faces, everybody is quiet, nobody is really contributing much. However, by midterm, people have pretty much identified who the quote unquote smart people are in the class and they measure themselves against that. Um, barometer and they realize that they are just as smart or they may be one or two of the people who are at the top of the class and they start to contribute more. People when they feel like they fit in are much more comfortable um, and that's one of the issues is that we don't want to stress ourselves out by being a non-conformist if we don't really care that much about a situation. Now, as part of your homework, you're also doing a assignment about the Milgram experiment and the Zimbardo experiment. And these three experiments on conformity really show that conformity is a human condition. Most of us like to think we are individuals who are not influenced in our decision making. But most of us are profoundly influenced by group pressure. Another concept is called groupthink. And this is the tendency for group members to reach a consensus opinion, even if that decision is downright stupid. Researcher I.L. Janis looks specifically at the place of stupidity that most often can be seen, which is the government, and how decisions are made. And one of the examples that he looked at um, was on very little evidence about weapons of mass destruction. The President of the United States declared war on Iraq in 2003. And again, you know, nobody really thought this was a terrific idea, but people went along with it. We didn't have a lot of data, but oh my God, what happens if Saddam Hussein has a nuclear bomb? And this got everybody in a tizzy and of course we go and invade and we topple Saddam Hussein and discover that there are no weapons of mass destruction. Were there chemical weapons? Absolutely. But again, those are not something that you can utilize in the way that we expected a nuclear bomb to be utilized. There's also a concept called risky shift which is the tendency for groups to be more risky than individuals. The mechanism behind this concept is called de-individuation, which is the sense that oneself has merged with a group. The blame is shared by the group, not the individual. So we're seeing a dilution of responsibility. And as the group gets bigger, risk taking increases. Every year in Spain, you'll see this picture over here, they have the running of the bulls and all kinds of young men test their metal 
by putting on white clothes with a red sash and running through the streets while the bulls follow them, attempting to gore them. And every year, somebody gets hurt. Sometimes people get killed. But this behavior continues because it's seen as a way of testing your level of machismo, your level of manliness. And again, you know, individually, none of us really want to pull over to the side of the road and get into a field with a bull because they're not very nice animals. They're very aggressive and they will hurt you. Um, But if we're with a group, hey, that sounds like a great idea. Um, And then, you know, white power supremacists do this all the time. They're in a group of five or six. They pick on one guy. They're not picking on groups of five and six. They're picking on one guy because now they know they can beat them. So individual responsibility goes away and it becomes part of this group mentality. So we're going to change gears a little bit and talk about organizations. A formal organization is a large secondary group highly organized to accomplish a complex task or achieve goals efficiently. So corporations, government, very significant in terms of having a goal. Organizational culture are the norms and values that shape the behavior of people within an organization. Um, For example, dress codes. You know, there's some companies that are very specific about what they want you to wear. Other companies, they don't really care too much. But the more formal the organization, the more formal the dress code. So you go to a company like Goldman Sachs and everybody's in suits, ties. Everybody's expected to have a certain haircut or a lack of facial hair. And we see these things and it's a great way to build group cohesion, but it can go terribly wrong. Um, The Sandusky situation at Penn State was a mess, and it was partly because football was so important at this university that nobody wanted a scandal to come down on the football organization, but, you know, this guy Sandusky was raping children. And nobody wanted to come forward and make a big deal about it because that would mean the football team would be affected. And with the football team comes all the money that the university makes from the football team. So it became a huge mess. The man got away with um, raping children far longer than he should have. And Joe Paterno's legacy is sadly tainted forever. Now, within the concept of organizations, there are various types. We have a normative organization, which is also referred to as a service or voluntary organization. People join these to pursue goals that they consider worthwhile. They don't receive salary or money. Rather, they feel a personal satisfaction or it helps enhance their status. Oftentimes, students will volunteer with Habitat for Humanity a couple times a year so they can put it on their resume. It looks really good that they've been doing charitable work. These groups are created to achieve a certain purpose or meet a particular need. Examples include the Rotary Club, the NAACP, B'nai B'rith, certain political action clubs. You know, the NAACP was founded in 1909 as a way for African Americans to create some level of political power um, and get more rights. And, you know, the NAACP was very instrumental in the 1964 civil rights um, bill that was passed by President Johnson. So, you know, these groups are not going to make somebody rich, but they can be very powerful. Then you have the type of organization that is coercive. A coercive organization is characterized by membership that is largely involuntary. So, for example, a prison or a mental hospital. And um, Irving Goffman, the sociologist, has characterized these organizations as what is called total institutions because the individual is cut off from the rest of society and the residents are subject to strict social control. 
Um, so in this situation, the staff exercises complete control over the residents. And again, when you look at the Zimbardo experiment, if you have not already, you will see the dangers inherent in this kind of scenario. And also schedules and routines are rigidly adhered to. A utilitarian organization are organizations people join for financial profit even if the organization itself is nonprofit. And for the vast majority of us, this means the place where we go to work every day. Now, within an organization, you have something called bureaucracy, which is the, if you think about it in anatomical terms, it's the skeleton of the organization. And it is characterized by these six items that sociologist Max Weber came up with. Number one, a high degree of division of labor and specialization, meaning, you know, you have engineers doing engineering stuff and accountants doing business um, transaction information. You have a hierarchy of authority or a chain of command. So you have a boss, your boss probably has a boss, your boss's boss has a boss, and so on and so forth. There are rules and regulations, impersonal relationships, um, career ladders, which is advancement through the organization. A lot of people want to get in on the ground floor and work their way up through an organization. And then last but not least, and this is kind of ironic in a way, but a bureaucracy is supposed to be efficient, despite what we see with government sometimes. Now, there are some problems that are inherent in a bureaucracy. The first one is ritualism, which means a rigid adherence to the rules, even if following the rules can cause danger to employees or others. So just go back to the Sandusky situation at Penn State. Each person reported the case to their supervisor, but the supervisor up at the top ultimately did nothing. So the assistant coach who saw what was going on told Joe Paterno, who was the head coach. The head coach told the athletic director. The athletic director told the president. The athletic director and the president decided not to do anything because, going back to my previous comments, they didn't want scandal to occur with the football team. So the coaches reported the case because that was the rule. However, if someone sees a young boy being raped in the showers by an adult male, we have a moral obligation to go beyond the rules of the organization and call the police. And that's why Paterno and the assistant coach were so vilified during this experience because they knew this was going on and they knew that Sandusky had more than one young man that he was doing this to. They told their, their supervisors. They didn't go the next step and fulfill a moral obligation to help and to get someone in there who would stop these young boys being raped. Another problem inherent in bureaucracies is alienation. And this occurs when employees have little control over what they do or if they are treated like machines. Um, you know, we as humans, whether we are brilliant or not the brightest bulb on the tree, as they say, we want to be treated with respect and dignity. And when you take away somebody's respect, when you take away somebody's dignity, you basically humiliate them. This is why when people get fired from a company, they will come back with a gun sometimes. That's why you see this on the news. Because they've been dehumanized to the point where they no longer have empathy towards others. Along with alienation, in some organizations, employees are even isolated from one another, eliminating any chance of developing group cohesion. Um, you have these things called cubicle farms, and it's just row after row of cubicles. And people are not supposed to go visit each other in their cubicles unless they have business with one another. And again, this is a sense of dehumanizing. You can't trust me enough to get up and talk to a cube three cubes away from mine unless I specifically have a 
report I'm delivering. And again, this idea of dehumanization is very toxic to a workplace. Now, one of the benefits that occur in organization is diversity. We have an opportunity to work with people and engage with people that we may have never engaged with before. You know, before I started working at the media campus, I had never really met someone from Sierra Leone, for example. Now I know several people who have come from Sierra Leone. The fact of the matter is that organizations are going to expose us to much more diversity than anything at home or at our church. Now, the dominant culture in the country, as we discussed in a previous chapter, is white men. Studies have shown that when minorities or women make it to upper management, they often take on the same values of the dominant culture, conforming to the norms of white men. So you'll often see attitudes of someone of color or a woman that don't seem very consistent with her race or their gender. And it's because people feel like they have to conform or they'll get kicked out of the club. Studies have also demonstrated that being a minority in top management can cause excessive stress because one is hiding their true self. Now, that's not to say that di diversity doesn't exist. It does. Um, it's just not as frequent as it should be. Um, people who come from middle class or upper classes are more likely to be promoted than people who come from lower income groups. And a lot of times, this is just an unfamiliarity with the system. You know, if you don't know how to act in a particular environment, you're going to make mistakes. Whereas somebody who has been raised in an upper middle class household are going to have all those social niceties. They're going to know how to play golf. They're going to know how to play tennis. They're going to know how to make good martini. Um, but overall, the research demonstrates that diversity will lead to a more successful organization, higher profits, and more customers. And these two companies, which I know we've all heard of, demonstrate this to a T. They both have very strong diversity programs and um, go out of their way to ensure a diverse workforce. And how do you do that? You recruit in different arenas. You know, instead of putting an ad in the Philadelphia Inquirer, you put an ad on the internet that shows up when somebody is surfing um, a site that a lot of African Americans or a lot of Hispanic people would go to. So to finish up this lecture, we're going to look at the relationship of an individual to, an or to the organization from that theoretical perspective of functionalism, conflict theory, and symbolic interaction theory. In a functionalist perspective, individuals are like machine parts and are only somewhat relevant to the operation of the organization. Basically, people are cogs in a machine, and we're all about dehumanizing them. Conflict theory says that individuals are subordinated to the systems of power and experience stress and alienation as a result, meaning if we don't conform, we're going to be alienated and stressed out. In symbolic interaction, interaction between superiors and subordinates form the structure of the organization. So, in other words, a company like Walt Disney that's very diverse, they take on the ideas of a diverse workforce, which means that the company becomes more diverse and becomes more interesting and more functional in a sense, in a way. Um, so that's it for this lecture. If you have any questions, please text or email me. And otherwise, have a great day.